Hey everybody, my name is Tom. Uh, I work at Valve on the Steam business team. And today I'm talking about Steam 101. Uh, and this is basically a primer for helping you think about a lot of the marketing and business decisions that you're going to be making as you ship your game on Steam. Now, the context of this talk is kind of aimed at somebody who's maybe newer to shipping games, so maybe your first or second game, some of the things that you're going to be thinking about. Um, a lot of this talk is going to focus on really specific Steamworks tools and features. But most of the broader takeaways, I hope, are going to be applicable regardless of where you sell your game, what storefronts you're on, what platforms, and, uh, and so on. Uh, one of the reasons this talk even exists to begin with is that we've seen a lot of people ship games on Steam over the last couple of years. I mean, I'm assuming lots of you guys were in the keynote and heard from DJ about the huge explosion of indie games. Um, so there's a lot of people shipping games for the first time on Steam who haven't really thought through some of the marketing and business choices. And we see a lot of really fun or interesting games that sometimes struggle to get off the ground uh, just because they're missing out on a few super easy opportunities to communicate their message a little bit better to customers um, or expose their game in, in ways that are more interesting. So we're going to try to uh, identify some of those pitfalls really directly and then also examine some of the relevant tools and features that you can take advantage of uh, to solve some of those problems. It's worth also explaining what this session is not. This is definitely not a set of instructions. So you, couldn't, you shouldn't come away from this talk thinking, OK, here are the five things I have to do to be successful. That's definitely not the case. Uh, this is certainly not a substitute for making a great game. In fact, you could do everything right from a business and marketing perspective. But if your game doesn't resonate with users and delight them when they play it, uh, that's the only thing that really matters the most. And finally, this is not an advertising workshop or a set of marketing tricks that you can use to somehow get ahead. Uh, it's more a broader, how are you thinking about what questions are you asking? So that leads us to, what is this session? It's definitely a simple, basic introduction to some simple Steamworks tools on the business and marketing side. It's a guide to some very low-hanging fruit, simple changes that won't take you a lot of time or energy, but might have a big impact. And it's also advice to help you ask the right questions. And I, that's a theme that we'll come back to a bunch is, are you asking the right questions about your game and your customers that are going to lead you to smarter decision making? So this is a little bit of an outline of what we're going to cover. Um, we're going to start just by kind of defining goals a little bit. We're going to move to the architecture of your game on Steamworks, uh, how all the components and pieces play together uh, and how they're generated. We're going to look at really specific store page content. So this is marketing outputs like your trailer, your graphical assets. Um, we're going to talk about Steam keys, how to request them, how to use them wisely. Uh, look at some of the various game features that Steamworks offers and how to ask smart questions about those. Look at a couple of the self-help resources that Steamworks makes available, and then close with just a couple words of advice about your launch day. So that's where we're headed. The very first thing that you want to do as you're thinking about launching your game on Steam is to actually clearly define your goals. And it's amazing how many folks, especially on the first or second game that they work on, basically skip this step. There's something really exciting that you want to share with users and you sort of dive right in. But sometimes taking that moment to think a little more carefully about your uh, product can make a big difference. So some of the questions you want to ask and the goals you want to set what does success actually look like? Does everyone in your studio uh, know what that means? And if your studio is one person, do you know what that means? Um, what would success look like? Are you prepared to handle it? And uh, similarly, how would your team respond if you weren't successful right away? How long of a runway do you have? And uh, how are you going to get closer to success? The other question is about priorities. Uh, the classic example here would be maybe a team of four or five people who are working on a really fun multiplayer game, and they're all digging into the nuts and bolts of balancing characters and building better maps and optimizing netcode. And then it's time to ship, and you realize no one has really done any of the hard thinking about, how are we going to explain this game to customers? How do we make it exciting and show it off and build a community? Uh, Valve's not here to answer those questions for you. We're not here to tell you what kind of game you should make or how to serve your customers best. We do just want to give you the reminder of, hey, you need to ask those questions up front and sort of build a plan for your business uh, if you're actually going to make forward progress. The next topic we're going to dive into is the architecture of your game on Steamworks. And this is a, a deceptively simple topic that a lot of times gets lost. We see a lot of developers uh, 
confused or just kind of making strange decisions about how their product is laid out on Steam because of misunderstandings of how all the underpinnings work. Um, so we're going to define a couple terms and, and look at how they work together in Steamworks. We're going to use the app landing page as sort of a model for some of this. This example is from Worlds Adrift. It's a real Steam game. It's in coming soon mode right now, made by Bossa Studios. Thanks, Ricardo, for letting us use your app landing page. Um, and it has all of the elements of your game on Steam, your store packages, all of the associated app IDs, uh, the ability to edit your store page and configure different features, the marketing and visibility tools, um, and even buttons to lead off to the financial data pages so you can see your sales data and reporting. Uh, so everything sort of lives here. We're not going to go line by line and look at every single one of these things. It's just important to understand where they're all laid out under the same umbrella in Steamworks. This is the diagram that'll help us understand the individual elements. So every game on Steam has this base app ID. That's sort of the catch-all. That is your game. Directly underneath your app ID are content depots. Those are the chunks of content that Steam is actually pushing through servers to customers so that they can download and, and play your game. Uh, in this visual example, we have depots for uh, Mac and Windows and Linux. If you have really big localization files, you might also have depots broken out by language uh, if needed. Um, and then uh, all wrapping that up, sort of enclosing both the app ID and the depots is a package. A package is the item that customers buy off of the Steam store. It's also the item from which you request Steam keys. So whether I buy a game or I activate a key, I'm adding a package to my account. And once I add that package, I'm getting whatever app IDs and depots are included. And then sort of off to the side of your base app ID, you have all these supplemental app IDs. That's things like a DLC, demo if you choose to make one, um, tool app IDs. So if you had like a level editor that needed a standalone executable, you could use a tool app ID. And so that's sort of the, the setup. Um, and the really nice thing is we have these tools inside of Steam to let you create and set up this stuff yourself. If you need a dedicated server app ID for your multiplayer game, you can literally just make one yourself. If you want to add DLC or generate a store bundle to sell your product with uh, other products that you publish, you can do that. Uh, the big kind of caveat thing is we're trusting you to make decisions about your own product. We're not going to define how many pieces of DLC you can add or whether or not to um, put your game in a bundle with a soundtrack and a DLC and another game or a sequel. That's all up to you, but it's a little bit of the Spider-Man thing. With great power comes great responsibility. And so the, the mistake we sometimes see developers make and the thing we want to remind people of is that having a really complex offer on your store is not the same thing as having a really interesting, valuable offer on your store page. Um, and the question to ask yourself here is, how quickly can you explain how someone buys your game? If you need a two-paragraph email to somebody else to explain all the different purchase options and ways that customers can buy your game off of one store page, that's probably a level of complexity that might be doing more harm than good. Um, and so again, you just need to think carefully about how are we using these tools that we have and, uh, and taking the best advantage of them. The next topic we're going to dig into is store page content. This is a really meaty one. This is like the concrete marketing outputs that you are generating and shipping and the things that are helping customers discover your game on Steam. And all of them live on the Edit Store page admin. Again, this is still the world's adrift app ID. This is exactly what it looks like in Steamworks, as many of you already know. You've got a bunch of tabs here to define things like your system requirements, and um, this is where you enter the description of your game. We could talk a bunch about the store page. We're just going to focus today on three specific tabs, the Early Access tab, the Graphical Assets tab, and uh, the Trailers tab. And if this amount of information seems a little overwhelming, there's actually an awesome video tutorial that we have posted that'll walk you through how to create a store page and, and make some of these trade-offs. We're just going to focus on the three biggest chunks uh, right here. The first one is Early Access. Uh, we could easily give an hour-long presentation just on early access. In fact, if you come back tomorrow in this room, there's a panel with a bunch of experienced developers who are going to share the lessons they learned, um, the highs and lows, what's good about early access, what could be challenging. Um, the big takeaway or the thing to sort of remind you is there can sometimes be a knee-jerk sort of reaction against early access. Early access games sometimes get painted with a certain brush, but what we found is it's actually an incredibly successful way to develop and sell games. Uh, if you look at the top sellers list on Steam at any given week or during one of the big seasonal sales, you'll see a bunch of early access titles up there. 
Now, that doesn't mean that early access titles automatically make a game sell better. It just means that when used correctly, this is a super valuable tool for you to build a better and better game over, over time and get your community involved. Uh, whether or not you should do early access is, is a pretty serious question for your team and your studio. And uh, we don't decide for you. It's entirely up to you to launch your game in early access or not. And uh, like so many other features, it's sort of set up for you to enable. You can literally check a box, and now your game is going to be in early access. But the process is, uh, much like we were discussing here, a series of questions that you have to ask and sort of critically answer to figure out, is early access right for you? So if you're in this tab of your store page and you're really struggling to come up with compelling answers for the questions that we ask, that's probably a good indicator to you that either early access might not be perfect for your game or you just need to go back to the drawing board and think a little bit more about the topic. And that's another one of the questions that uh, we think you should be asking is uh, maybe the common pitfall or mistake that we've seen some devs make is they're so excited to release their game and put it in front of customers, which is great, uh, that they just launch it as quickly as they can. And then 48 hours later, they're listening to feedback, they're seeing press reviews, and they're thinking, wow, there's actually a lot of rough edges on this game that I wish I had um, rounded out. There's a lot of things we still want to work on as a team. Maybe we should have been in early access. Um, and I think if you're thinking critically about it before you press the button and launch, you're going to save yourself and maybe your customers a lot of confusion and frustration. That doesn't mean you have to launch in early access or you should never launch in early access. It means like everything else, you've got to think about your own customers and the product you're making and what are your goals and, and focus back on that. The next chunk of your store page admin is just one tab over and it's the graphical assets. Um, these are the images that customers see all across the store. Um, they're the chief marketing asset. They'll probably be seen more than anything else that you make. Um, so they're really important to get right. It can be tempting when you think about that to say, oh, like we need to hire an advertising firm or we need to hire five designers to make the perfect capsules. That's totally not the case. Uh, you can be li very low-fi. You can make great capsule art even with a small team. Uh, you just need to think about a few basic things. And the mo probably the, the significant one is remembering the context in which these capsule arts get seen. So this is a list of games that are all in coming soon mode on Steam. And this is literally just a screenshot of how they appear in the, um, in the queue. These are what we call small caps. They're the smallest capsule size. And the big takeaway is as you look at them, I don't know how well you can see them from where you're sitting, some of these immediately pop out and you can really read the name of the game clearly and easily. Others, they might be awesome games, but it's almost impossible to recognize the name, especially in a context like this. Um, and so the advice isn't copy Bossa, go make a red capsule with white text. Uh, it's just to think about, are you legible? Is the name of your game instantly readable and recognizable? Um, are you consistent? So what is your web presence for your game? How do you talk about it on Facebook? How do you have a, a, do you have a social media presence? Um, what's your cover art if you're selling your game at retail? Making sure your branding is kind of consistent everywhere, because that's what this capsule art is uh, really all about. And an easy question to ask yourself if you're getting ready to sub submit capsule art or you're thinking of your own game right now and wondering, is my capsule art this way? If somebody sees your capsule art on their mobile phone or on a really small laptop screen, can they even read the name of the game at the smallest size? Um, and then think, does it actually match the rest of my online and offline presence? Does this match with my social media, my web page, et cetera? So let's look at a couple concrete examples of capsule art. The one on the uh, left is from Caliber 10, uh, made by Flashman and Bongfish. They were kind enough to let us use this as an example. When they first submitted this capsule art, we immediately came back with feedback. Can't really see the name of your game. It's hard to read all the extra text and information. I don't really get the sense of what your game is at all. Um, and those are easy things to fix uh, as long as you're recognizing them ahead of time. The capsule on the right from Starbound, uh, made by Chucklefish, does a lot of things that are very, very simple, but very, very effective. The first one is that logo, that Starbound logo with the awesome sun as the letter O, is present in every piece of marketing. That's immediately recognizable with their brand. And even at the smallest sizes or at the smallest resolution, you can immediately recognize this game as Starbound. So if somebody's only ever heard the name of your game once, or they heard a friend talk about it, or they watched a YouTube video about it six months ago, and now it's finally out, you want them to immediately be able to connect with uh, the name of your game. Crystal clear, super legible, and you want to be consistent with your branding. 
The next topic is trailers. And again, we're back in the edit store page admin, just one tab over. Uh, this is a super important marketing output for you to think about. Uh, and the tools are really simple. It's literally a screen where you can drag and drop in a video, give it the name you want. We tell you right on the tool the resolution and, and the file type that you need to upload. You can reorder them. You can add subtitles and localized files. Uh, it's a really simple tool. And like a lot of things on Steam, I think because it's simple, it doesn't really generate enough critical thought uh, when people are using it. Capsule Art's kind of the same way. Um, you want to be really thoughtful about what this trailer is and where people will be seeing it. And so let's look at the real life context for a lot of trailers on Steam. In a huge number of cases, your trailer is going to appear in context like this. Somebody who's clicking through their discovery queue, and they've got that little orange uh, gold button in the bottom to just move on to a next game and, and see what's out there, what's recommended to them. It's not a secret that attention spans are lower than they used to be, uh, especially online. And so you might have less than 10 seconds to actually make an impression on your customers, uh, catch their attention and keep them paying attention. You don't want to waste that opportunity to make an elevator pitch and get somebody really excited about your game. So the questions to ask yourself here, and you can literally think about the trailer that you have uploaded on YouTube or on your Steam store page right now. If a user only saw the first five seconds, would they learn anything interesting about your game? And the other question is, what if they saw the trailer with no audio at all? Would they still learn something about your game? Uh, because that's the way a lot of these videos are going to be seen. So I've got a couple of video examples of this on the next slides. Uh, the first one I'm going to show is a great example because it's a beautiful game. If you watch the whole trailer, it's really well produced. They've got awesome music. It's really atmospheric. But a bunch of customers are never going to get to that part. Uh, this is from the game Dead Effect 2 uh, with permission from Badfly Interactive. So we're not going to watch the entire trailer. I, I put in the little 19-second blurb that you guys might have noticed. 19 seconds is how long it takes for me to learn anything about this game other than uh, a couple splash screens at the beginning. And in a lot of cases, that's too long. This is a really cool game that's telling a really cool story in its trailer. And a lot of the most valuable content is going to get missed by a huge number of customers. Again, this is a case where you actually don't need to hire a marketing firm or have 25 people working for three months on a cinematic. You might actually be able to make your trailer better tomorrow by removing pieces from it and just making sure you're thinking about the context in which it's going to be seen. For contrast, uh, this is a trailer that I think does a really good job of some of the things we've talked about. It grabs your attention pretty quickly, um, and it's kind of telling a customer a story right away. It's from the game called Renowned Explorers, made by Abbey Games. You are a renowned expedition leader, about to uncover the greatest mystery of your career, the emerged island. As you start exploring this mystical place, you hear chanting in the distance and decide to use some of your supplies for a detour. You discover some kind of ritual. But first, let's introduce your crew, Victor Sinyak. So again, we're not going to watch the entire trailer, but one of the things that Abbey Games did so well here is they make it immediately clear what the hell is this game and how does it feel to play it. Even if you had no sound, you could immediately see the menus, the interaction, you get a sense of what you're actually doing in the game. Um, the other thing I think they do really well that uh, is easy to miss is they plant a little narrative hook right in the first 15 seconds of their trailer. So you get introduced to this interesting thing, you're exploring a new area of the island, but wait, let's move to another topic. You've already got a little bit of a hook that you're going to be able to refer back to and give customers a reason to keep watching your trailer. So again, now that we've watched those two trailers, it's worth remembering what are the questions we're asking. If somebody only watches five or 10 seconds of my trailer, do they learn anything cool about my game? Do they want to learn more and maybe even try it out? And second, if they watch the trailer with no sound, could they still get a sense of what's actually happening and why it's interesting? So we're going to move on to marketing and visibility now. Uh, this is another section of your app landing page. If the store page section was a little bit more about the content that you're putting out in front of customers, the marketing and visibility section is useful more for maybe getting data out of the system. 
So this is a dedicated section of your app landing page. It's a really valuable source of data for you, uh, and it's also where you'll find a really cool tool called Update Visibility Rounds. The first thing we're going to look at is the traffic breakdown data that you get back from this section, and then we'll look at the, the update visibility rounds. Uh, the data in the next few slides is from Valve's game Portal 2, so it's been out a little while. It's nobody else's data except ours. So your traffic breakdown is a graph just like this one. Uh, it's a really cool tool because it doesn't just show you the raw number of impressions. It actually lets you track them over time and break them out by section. So you can see what's coming from search, who's searching for your game, what uh, store page views are coming from the home page, or if you were on sale, uh, a special section, things like that. Um, and this is, bless you. Uh, this is a super useful view for kind of seeing how your exposure is changing over time. Uh, not pictured in this graph is the time sliders where you can input your own dates and see over three months or six months how did your visibility change. Uh, the next slide digs in a little bit more to numbers and percentages. If you can't actually read those numbers, don't worry about it. Um, the big takeaway there is this is a super useful area if you're running experiments and you're trying to actually quantify like what was the lift of something. For instance, let's say you paid for some marketing and you're trying to figure out how many of those uh, dollars actually turned into people viewing my page. You can track that really easily here. It's also a great place to think about if, um, let's say, a YouTuber covers your game, or maybe you go to some conference and a guy on a stage tells you you can make better capsule art and you change it out. Did that even make a difference? Did you get any more click-throughs from the various places that you're listed on uh, Steam? So the next chunk of this category, the marketing and visibility tools, is the update visibility rounds. Um, this is a really useful tool for communicating specifically about content updates. So once your game is already released, it's been out for a little while, and you're shipping really big, uh, interesting patches. Uh, these are super simple to use. You have to make an announcement in your community hub, sort of detailing the big content update that you just made. And then you drop in here and click Start Visibility Round, and you can pair visibility for your game on Steam with the major content update that you just made. Uh, and this is what they actually look like in Steam. Uh, these are actually three really good examples. Uh, Intrude shipped a new level editor. The game Space Jacked, they added a story mode and an easy mode. Stardew Valley shipped like a version 1.1 and added a bunch of features. This is the level of content that we're thinking about that's really worth talking to customers about and getting them excited. I think the, the common pitfall or mistake that newer devs sometimes make here is they'll ship patch notes and kind of feel like, hey, that's enough. Um, nothing against shipping patch notes. That can be great. Your dedicated community is probably going to love pouring through that, looking at all the changes you made. But patch notes don't make for a super compelling narrative. They don't really tell a story. They're not a headline, right? They're not a story. So you kind of need to ask yourself, if somebody who is brand new to my game and had never heard of it before saw this update, would they understand why it's kind of cool and valuable? Would it give them a reason to, to maybe get involved with my game? Similarly, if I sent this update to a press outlet and I was trying to get um, news coverage, what would their headline be? Could they even really make something meaty out of this? So if you're building a little bit of a story into your updates and, and making, rolling them up into a significant patch, that's pretty special. The next topic we're going to talk about is uh, Steam keys. We've talked about a lot of the nuts and bolts on the marketing side, and this is a useful tool for thinking about how to grant pre-release access to your game before it comes out, and also how to help you sell your game in other places. Uh, Steam keys are, are a, a really simple topic. They're easy to misunderstand things, so we just want to clarify for everybody that Steam keys really are free. Uh, Valve doesn't charge any fee at all when you request keys, and we also don't collect any royalties when the keys are activated by end users. Uh, they're a totally free Steamworks feature for you. Uh, you can use them to help run your business and reach your customers if they help you do that. And this is what the actual interface uh, looks like inside of Steam to request keys. You've got a list of packages. Uh, you've got the ability to tag the request that you're making. And then you've got the ability to input the number of keys that you want. So a quick word on the packages. You might remember them from uh, a few slides ago. That's sort of the container that you're handing to a customer to give them access to your app ID and your depots. The top package here in this uh, example that's kind of in the yellow gold color, that's a release override package. So that's really specifically for granting pre-release access to your game to QA testers or um, press copies or for YouTubers or something like that. That's something you're going to request pretty small batches of keys from and be really careful how you're handing them out. 
the second package is just your general store package, and that's what you are going to be using if you're selling your game at retail in box copies and you want to include a Steam key, or you're selling your game via Steam keys on your own website or other stores. Uh, the most important lesson here is to tag your keys, and in this example, I'm not sure how legible it is for you. I've chosen from the drop-down the tag of YouTubers. Uh, the reason I want to tag my keys before I request them is that it actually helps me keep track of them moving forward into the future. So Steam has built-in key activation tracking so that you can see by tag and by country where your keys are being activated. And that's available right in the product data financial pages. This is a super useful uh, tool for you to sort of keep track of your inventory. So let's look at what that actually looks like. This is the sort of screen you'll see inside of the product data pages that shows you the tag that you chose and then the countries in which those keys were activated. Um, and this is like a classic example, especially if you're uh, running some of your business at retail or on other stores. Let's say you have a retail partner in Japan and you provide them with 1,000 Steam keys to put into box copies of your game. They're being sold on the shelves in Tokyo. Uh, you request those keys, you tag them, you send them out, and then you can track the redemptions in the product site. And if you see that you sent those 1,000 keys to Japan, but they're all being activated in um, North and South America, you know something's amiss. Uh, it gives you the data you need to go back and say, how did these keys get lost in transit, or why are they ending up where I didn't intend? It gives you a little bit of accountability and data on where your keys are going. If you just request one huge batch of keys and hand them out to different retailers, there's no way for you to keep track of which keys went to which place. Uh, and that can be really tough for you. So let's talk about selling your keys elsewhere a little bit. Uh, Valve doesn't think that you should sell your game exclusively on Steam. You should sell your game wherever customers are excited to buy it. Uh, don't limit your customers' choices. Don't limit your business opportunity. If you want to sell your game on other places using Steam keys, that's awesome if it helps you run your business. If you don't want to use Steam keys, that's fine too. The, uh, the big lessons we want to give you, and this is absolutely pun intended, is just five key lessons. Uh, the first one is to remember that keys are free, but that doesn't mean they don't have value. Um, it's a mistake to think that because you can get them without paying any money, uh, they don't have any cost. The, the real thing, if you're not thinking critically about how you distribute your keys, they can cause damage to your business uh, long term. And a really simple question to ask up front is, what's the dollar value of every one of these keys? If I sell my game for $10 and I request 10,000 Steam keys, that's $100,000 worth of inventory. And so just thinking about it in those real dollar or euro or pound or whatever terms is uh, hopefully going to help you think about, OK, what does this actually mean for my business? Uh, the next key lesson is to only request the keys you actually need. Um, you want to be smart about the number of keys you're requesting. So if you're selling keys on other stores or on your own website, um, you can ask some of those questions in advance. What's a reasonable monthly forecast uh, on this store? How many keys am I likely to get through? Um, how many keys should I request for one month? And then you can see how your business is doing. And if you need more keys, you can always get more quickly and easily for free. Um, so you can protect a little bit of your own business and, and uh, minimize risk by being smart about the number of keys you get to begin with. You also want to think carefully about the downstream costs. I think this is especially true for uh, release override keys that you're distributing before your game comes out. Um, you want to ask yourself, where might these keys end up? Uh, do I know who's receiving this key to my game and, and where it might go next? Um, how it might be resold or used without my permission? Um, you want to think really carefully before handing out keys. And to that end, there's a few really great tools to help you do that, especially for like press copies and pre-release keys. You can actually verify who's receiving your keys. Uh, the tool highlighted uh, behind me, dodistribute.com, is made by Vlambeer. Uh, they're a, a game studio themselves. Um, it is a really easy way to make sure that the keys you're submitting actually land with verified press. Uh, there's other tools like it. You don't have to use that one. It's not made by Valve, but it might solve this problem for you. The big question that you're asking yourself is, have I actually confirmed who's on the other end of this conversation? Do I know who's receiving this key? And do I have a way of tracking where it ends up? Uh, and then the last piece is just to remember to try to ask these questions before you request the Steam keys and have them in your hand instead of after. There's a bunch of uh, really frustrating and time-consuming problems that partners sometimes have when they're distributing Steam keys. And you'd much rather spend that time and energy focused on your customers, making a great game, thinking about how to grow your business, instead of 
triaging uh, problems that were easy to avoid to begin with. So ask those questions before you request the keys instead of once they're out the door. We're going to switch gears here and talk about game features a little bit. This is really fun, actually, to talk about. This talk is not really scoped to give you a technical walkthrough of how to integrate Steam features. Uh, really, the goal is just to give you some advice about them. Um, Steam 201, the talk that's in this room next, actually has some really interesting context and, and advice from experienced developers. Um, and there's also a handful of other talks here at DevDays on things like the Steam controller, the Steam inventory service. So if you want to dig into specifics, you definitely can. Um, for the purposes of this, I want to reference all the way back to the beginning of the talk and think about those goals you defined. What are you trying to accomplish? What does success look like? Um, and ask yourself kind of what's feasible, given my resources, the size of my team, the day I want to launch, what can I do and what's going to be most valuable? So kind of envisioning your game, uh, there's this huge list of features you can take advantage of. Some of them are super basic, some of them are a little more complex. Uh, I think the mistake that some newer devs make is they think about this like an arithmetic problem. And you can hear it in the questions they'll ask. Developers will want to know, what percentage of games use the Steam Workshop? Oh wow, does that mean my game needs the Steam Workshop too? Um, how many more copies will I sell if I integrate Steam trading cards? Um, things like along those lines. Will Valve feature my game in the Halloween sale if I add this feature? Uh, that's really not the way we think about the platform, and it's probably not a productive line of thinking for you. Uh, just as an example, we're going to look at a bunch of different games and the different features they have implemented. This is not a, there's no X, Y, and Z feature that you can magically integrate and be more successful. You just need to think about what are the goals of your game and your business. So let's look at some of those games. This is uh, Osiris, New Dawn. This game just came out a little while ago in early access. They're an online multiplayer game, and they're in early access. So they have a lot of work to do regardless. They have shipped with a very minimal set of Steam features. There's not a lot of bells and whistles. They're really working on the core game experience for their customers right now. So there's not a lot happening here. But that doesn't mean that's the right path for every game. Uh, Cluster Truck came out recently as well. They've got a really interesting game that sort of thrives on having leaderboards and uh, letting people make their own levels. And so those are super valuable features for their game that they've chosen to integrate. Another good example is Hover Junkers. This is a VR game that's had a lot of success on Steam. Um, again, they've got a totally different set of needs from other games, and so the features they've chosen to focus on end up being pretty different. Uh, and then there's really interesting examples like Unturned, which is a, a very successful free-to-play game on Steam. They use a huge number of features. They've integrated the inventory service. They have trading cards. They're a free-to-play game that's still in early access. They've built a level editor. They have Steam cloud saves. They're taking advantage of all these different things. But uh, when the day that they shipped, they didn't magically have all these things. These are all features that were sort of added and integrated over time. So the question you need to ask yourself really is, what set of these features is most valuable for my goals and my customers? The really cool thing about Steam is that it was literally designed for this. It was built to enable low-cost, low-risk iteration. So you don't have to hire a team of 30 people to build out this really complex uh, feature. In a lot of cases, Steamworks will already provide it to you for free. So you can try some of these simple things and learn from them. Not all of them are always going to pan out, and that's OK. Uh, we just want to enable you guys, the actual game creators, to iterate quickly and creatively without taking on a huge amount of risk. So this is a huge amount of information that we've covered now, um, and it's been the, the width and breadth of business decisions and Steamworks tools. If it's starting to feel a little bit daunting, that's totally OK. Uh, there's a bunch of really good self-help resources that you can rely on now and ongoing as you ship your game uh, to get guidance at any time. And uh, one of the most valuable ones is just the documentation. This, is, this dropdown is visible on every Steamworks page. You can get to the documentation or contact Steam Publishing. That's people like me uh, if you're stuck or you need help. Uh, the interesting thing for uh, a bunch of these features is we have to make them in such a way that they are simple enough for even a one-man team to be able to uh, harness and take advantage of. But they also need to be so powerful that the biggest online multiplayer games in the world can use them and benefit from them. And so to that end, we've tried to build out enough documentation and resources to actually help folks uh, solve concrete problems. There's also a great set of tutorial videos. I mentioned one of them earlier. 
Um, they're available at the URL at the bottom of the screen, or you can just Google Steamworks Developer Tutorials. I'm sure you'll find them. They're all public. Um, they walk through a variety of things like adding DLC for the first time, how to add uh, other platform supports if you're adding like Mac or Linux support after you launch, how do you do that, um, building your store page, really basic stuff like that. Uh, and these videos are really great. There's also a bunch of videos from Dev Days 2014, um, and we're recording all the talks at this conference as well, so within hopefully a few weeks, uh, all of the other talks will be online as well. So if you wanted to learn about the Steam controller, but you came to this session and said, don't worry, you'll still be able to see that talk. Uh, Valve also regularly makes our own announcements through the Steamworks homepage. Uh, we automatically email really big news to any uh, Steamworks partners in the system, but we also keep a running tab of the recent Steamworks announcements right on your Steamworks homepage. So this is where we communicate things like uh, if there's anticipated downtime to the tools, if a big sale event is coming, um, if some other change, like we're adding new currency support and you need to submit prices, that's where we'll communicate all that information. And just checking in there every time you log into Steamworks is a great way to stay up to date with uh, what's happening. There's also a great way to connect to each other, um, and that's the Steam developer forums. There's a huge amount of resources right here in the room with us, uh, folks who have maybe solved the problem you're grappling with right now or dealt with the issue that you uh, were frustrated by last week. I think the question to ask here as far as the developer forums is really twofold. The first one is ask yourself, are you reinventing the wheel? Uh, is this something that a bunch of other games have already solved, maybe with similar or slightly different tools that you can piggyback on their knowledge and expertise? Uh, the other question is, how relevant is this feedback to my customers and my game? Every game is different, and so you do want to filter the information you get and the advice you get from other developers uh, through the lens of your own product. Uh, the developer forums are also a great way to reach out to Valve. Uh, depending on the topic, different employees are monitoring different forums and, and trying to help you guys solve problems as they come up. So the very last topic we're going to dig into is just a little bit of brief advice on your launch day. Uh, this is a, an extremely stressful and exciting day for all developers. Um, and I think the biggest takeaway is probably the advice that this is the starting line, not the finish line. Um, remember, if you launch your game on a Friday afternoon, you're probably in for a really long weekend uh, because the day you launch your game is going to be filled with so many unanticipated problems and a lot of excitement that's positive and a lot of panic moments uh, as well. And so if you're serious about making a really great product for customers, it's pretty much a guarantee that the game you ship on launch day is not going to be the best that you can do, right? You're going to keep patching it, making it better, adding more features and content over time. And so remember that launch is really only the beginning. Um, and you need to be prepared for the amount of uh, work that you'll probably have in the days immediately following. The last piece of advice is keep calm and update your game. Uh, when we ship things, whatever they are, when we put on a conference or run a sale or release a game, uh, it's really easy to lose sight of this advice. Everybody does it, uh, whether it's your first game or your tenth. And so you need to actively build into your process, um, whether you're a one-man team or a 20-person studio or a big publisher. You need to think about what are you trying to accomplish and is any given action getting you closer to that goal or further away from it? Uh, I think a lot of times on launch day, people panic or get uh, so nervous that they end up doing things that are counterproductive. And so we think that in a lot of cases, listening to your customers and your audience and press and whoever else, and making iterative changes to your product is going to be way more productive than other ways you could spend your energy. Um, and the last thing, just to sort of close on an optimistic note here, is to remember that it's an awesome time to be a game developer on any platform, uh, and it's an awesome time to be a developer on PC. Uh, if you were here in the keynote, you saw some of the graphs of, of how fast Steam is growing, not just in the number of games that are showing up to the platform, but also the amount of time customers are spending, the amount of money customers are spending. It's an awesome, exciting time to be a game developer. Technology is moving faster and faster. There's a bunch of new platforms uh, and frontiers, whether you're making a VR game or a traditional game. And so this is a huge open marketplace for you to tap into and take advantage of. 
Uh, and so remember why you're doing this. Uh, we love games at Valve, and we're pretty sure our customers love games. All of their behavior seems to indicate that they really like games, and we're pretty sure that you love games too, or you probably wouldn't be here. So try to keep that in mind as you work on your product, um, and remember that it's an awesome time to be a PC game dev. Uh, thank you all so much for coming to the conference and coming to this talk. I hope it was worth your time and valuable. Uh, if you have feedback, if you have questions, both about the talk or the event at large, I'm reading all the email that goes to Steam Dev Days at valvesoftware.com, and I would love to hear from you guys. Uh, if you see me running around the rest of the conference, please grab me and say hi and ask questions. Thanks again for coming. Take care.